I don't know exactly how we're going to start it. I think I know how she started. it. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Frankenstein. Mm. If you haven't read the book Frankenstein, spoiler alert, I'm about to tell you everything that happens in the book. So if you want to read the book, pause this now, go read the book. That is fantastic, brother. I'm really glad that you had said that. There's a lot of people on the internet who'd be like, what do you mean an entire podcast about the book would give me spoilers? You're supposed to write one without this. <laughs> supposed to give you basically the back of the book i'll just read that aloud and then we'll all talk about that yeah so the weird thing about this is that this is the first podcast we've done in a really long time and it's also the first time which is the first time we've ever looked at each other during a recording of anything because everything we do is looking at a screen yeah you got intense eyes brother the only pro the only podcast we've ever done have been over skype so we've actually this is really it's awkward it's weird people don't talk like this anymore people don't look at each other when they talk anymore. no definitely not with the same intensity either because normally yeah. when you talk to someone you're looking around at other stuff you're doing stuff or you got your fucking phone out mm -hmm. let's not talk about that <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about frankenstein let's talk about frankenstein so is this supposed to be a comparison of the book or is this just the book because you're you're today this, this is you presenting to me because i haven't read the book yeah this is this is the book almost exclusively i want to do this because i feel like none of the movies do justice to it mm. but the one movie that keeps rattling around in my head is the 94 mary shelley frankenstein yes. robert de niro plays the monster i remember how upset you were because <laughs> we were you we were pretty young and the movie wasn't that like it i don't think it was that gory but when you see the female creation like she's really fucked up i can't remember it but i remember thinking like dad would even say like let's watch some mythbusters yeah because like after that before you guys go to bed because that's not the best thing to end on and then when i went back and watched the movie later i realized that scene is not even in the fucking book at oh. all that whole scene with her i think it was helen bonham carter actually played yes it was that yeah. role yeah yeah well, it's, it was Taylor. you and right was Ewan in there? No, I think it was, uh, it wasn't Eric Bana. No. Um, it was a guy who plays the defense against a dark arts teacher in the Chamber of Secrets. He played Frankenstein. Quarrel? No, no, in the Chamber of Secrets. Or, yeah, the second one. He's the guy who steals everyone's ideas and then wipes their memories. Wow, I can't even remember that movie. Come on, you're Harry Potter, dude. Okay, well, there's people out there who know who I'm talking about. I'm Harry Potter? <laughs> No, you, you got to get your Harry Potter oh, okay, yeah. info up. All right. So I want to, yeah, I want to go through the book, how it actually happens, because I think it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And also point out some of the things that were cool about the book that totally could have gone into the movies. Okay. All right. So I figure I'll just start with yeah. like, the basics of the plot. So it actually starts with a guy named Robert Walton, who is some sort of fisher, not a fisher. He's an adventurer. Adventurer. He wants to discover a new path to get across the world. So his plan is to go north from Europe and try to get to, I believe, South America. I don't know how he yeah. plans to do that. They didn't really understand maps back then. But well, they're still making them. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So he wants to explore, and it's sort of his life goal. So it starts off with him mailing to his sister, who lives in England, and telling her about all of this stuff. And uh, he starts by saying that, like, I really want a friend, but I'm obviously not going to find a friend out in the middle of nowhere going, like, up to the north. And I'm on a boat with all these, like, fisher dudes yeah. and these military men. So he's complaining about that at first. Then his voyage sets off. They go to the north. And when they're up in the north, they get stuck in ice just because that's how it is up there. Like, things just freeze and thaw and move. And when they're stuck, they see this really weird, huge figure just go flying by, like, with a dog sled. Like a oh. kilometer away. And they're all a little confused, but, you know, you've seen Stranger Things in the north. On a dog sled? Yeah. Yeah. And then a few days later, or maybe even the same day, uh, someone essentially washes up on, like, an ice raft. And they've got a dog sled, but most of the dogs are dead. And the guy himself is basically dead. So that is Frankenstein. They find Frankenstein on an ice float in the north. Because now that I'm thinking about it, that's... That's how the the uh, De Niro movie starts, starts right? Starts, yeah. And ends? Like, that's the frame device, right? Exactly. Is, it, is, is this two as well? Yeah, so that's how it's actually framed, is that this Robert Walton guy meets Frankenstein, and through meeting him, hears his story, and mm. writes the whole story to his sister in England. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that's sort of the idea of, like, that's how his story survived. Yeah. Uh, 
But I just think that it's kind of strange that some of them don't even recognize the idea of Walton, like, at all. So some of the movies, you mean? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, if you watch uh, the 2015 Victor Frankenstein, yeah, there's I'm... Igor in it, and Igor kind of shatters everything, because that has nothing to do with the story. There's no assistant. Is he supposed to be in Frankenstein? Igor is supposed to be his assistant. He's supposed to be just, like, the, you know kicked around peon lab guy that yeah. helps him build the monster well, i played igor in elementary school in a play <laughs> but oh god i'm pretty sure we like i'm trying to think because like, i'm trying to think of that part i can't remember like is igor part of frankenstein is that how it's supposed to be not in the book it's okay. not in the book at all but did he like i feel like he came from somewhere else yeah, I think he came from the original Frankenstein, like, oh. black and white movies, where there's, like, the... I don't know if you've ever seen that scene. There's, like, a windmill, and Frankenstein's being made in the windmill with the yeah, lightning. Yeah, the lightning, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then all the villagers are... Yeah, that's that's where Igor came oh, in, okay. is some of the movie. Well, that's also where the neck bolts came in, a lot of stuff like that. It's a little unnecessary. Yeah, well, the monster is really just described as being, like, an eight-foot-tall person who's not good-looking. Like, oh. Like, so not good-looking that he's, like very unsettling when people oh, okay. see him because he's well he's in the uncanny valley right he's humanoid but he's not a not human quite like, a for human, sure yeah. not a human so victor frankenstein tells him god his whole goddamn life story it's crazy the the book actually takes place over maybe two or three weeks of mm-hmm. him telling the story of his life it took me about that long to read actually so i guess that kind of makes sense yeah did you want to say just um the uh the author of the original book, just so we can clarify oh, for people. Yeah, Mary Shelley is the author. Is the Mary author of the Shelley. book? Okay. That, well, the movie, the 1994 movie, is mm-hmm. actually called Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Oh, because it's been bastardized so many times, they were trying to make it obvious that this was supposed to reflect the book. Oh, okay. Even though it doesn't it reflect does the book, quite, yeah, no. <laughs> it's pretty funny how that works. There's a lot of cases of that. There's like, like the the Batman series is like that. It's just like chopped up. It's like every, there's so many different versions of things, and there's like characters who came in at 2015, and <laughs> characters who came in in 1939. And Even the comics, it's it's just a shattered yeah. world, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think I think Mary Shelley does a really good job. There's even an author's note at the beginning where she describes how she wrote it. Oh, cool. So it was written. They uh, her husband was a poet. Uh, she was a writer. Her father was a writer. Her mom was a writer. Oh, and yeah. also one of their good friends was a writer. Yeah. So her, her husband, and the good friend were all sort of trapped at this cottage because it was just really shitty weather. It was just raining constantly. And so they came up with this competition, like, let's all write some sort of horror story. And then we'll just share, like a short story. Oh, that's a movie right there, buddy. Exactly. So they're, they wrote their stories. The poet wrote his. The, the friend wrote his. And then Mary Shelley didn't come up with an idea for a really long time. And then all of a sudden huh. it just hit her one day. And she had no choice but to just keep going with it. Turned it into what yeah, it is. I've had those. Just just something just hits you right in the face and you just go, wow. How did I not think of that? And just days of incessant passion. Yeah. Just writing shit down, getting it out of your head. But you, you had mentioned to me before this that her parents were also really famous writers, right? Yeah. Well, they were arguably more famous than she was in her hmm. lifetime. Because Frankenstein is one of those things that's become more popular with time. Yeah. But yeah, her mom was uh, a feminist activist. But this is back from the days when feminism was nowhere to be found. Like, she was one of the pioneers yeah. of that. And she wrote books about it. What year is this? Uh, 1819, Shit. Frankenstein was written. Either that or 1817. 1819? Yeah. Fuck, I th- I remember you saying the early 1900s. Jesus, this is an old movie. It's crazy, but... old, I- uh, sorry. Yeah, well, very old story. Although, compared to some stories, you know, still relatively fresh. This is this is actually considered the beginning of gothic writing. Hmm. Yeah, that's why Frankenstein I read in high school was because that was our example of a gothic story. I just heard from uh, QI, quite interesting. It's the... Fuck me, his name. I think it's Stephen Fry. Oh, remember. yeah, yeah, it's Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry. Stephen, yeah, yeah. Um, he was saying that gothic used to be an insult. Really? Yeah. And it, I don't know where the gothic architecture came from. I think it's that was the type of architecture that they did, and then it was referred to as gothic as an almost like an insult. But that's where like that's where the term goes, and then it evolved into goth, which is a like a kind of like an offshoot. Yeah, like wow. Today's version of it. It's very strange. 
Things get corrupted with time really easily. Do they ever? American Gothic, you know the the painting? It's the it's a pretty famous painting. It's a uh, yes, yes, with the father or the far, farmer and his wife. Yeah, and the pitchfork and the yeah. yeah it's called American Gothic because the window in the background is an, is a Gothic architecture window. You're kidding? No, that's exactly why it's called that. Way to fixate on the tiny details. And I don't even think the people in it are related. I'm pretty sure the the dudes is dentist or something, and then. The girl might be his wife, but... Like, it's oh, so, so those are actually people. Yeah, he didn't just, those like... Those are real people, yeah. Oh, whoa. Yeah. It's weird to think of paintings made of actual people. Yeah. Because is that an image of them? No. But is that them? Yeah, kind of. Well, that was what was so weird about meeting uh, NSP, was that they were in three dimensions. I'd only <laughs> ever seen them in two. Flat images in tiny screens. And suddenly there was this gigantic human... Like, I actually even said to Danny, like, you're so much bigger in person. <laughs> It was unbelievable to break that illusion. Yeah. Like, to go from legend to reality was so strange. Wow. So I don't... Wait, you haven't seen the Mary Shelley Frankenstein in a long time, right? No, not since okay. kids. Because the more you know about the movie, the funnier it seems, like when you read the book, because you're just like, Jesus, like, they could have actually just done this book, but for some reason they didn't feel like people were ready. Yeah. So, so he goes to tell his story, and it starts off really mundane. It's like, you know, I had a childhood with a great mother, great father... And uh, he had an adopted sister who is also, like, supposed to be his wife one day. This was, sorry, is this the adventurer? Uh, no, so this is now Frankenstein telling his story to Walton. Right, and to clarify for anybody who's confused like I am, who keeps thinking of the wrong thing, Frankenstein is the scientist, not the monster. Yes, so I will, yeah, Victor Frankenstein is the scientist, so I'll call him Frankenstein. Yes. And the monster, the creature... Those are basically... And the demon. Those are the only real names that Duh, he gets. Nero. <laughs> That's why they chose him. <laughs> yeah. That's why. Um, there's another example of, of things being corrupted over time. People think that Frankenstein's monster is Frankenstein. Yeah. They call him Frankenstein. Yeah, it's, it's really cut and dry in a lot of the movies that Frankenstein's kind of this bad dude. But in the books, it becomes really obvious that... He made one mistake and everything from there just snowballed mm. and there wasn't, you know, wasn't much to be done. Yeah. So he talks about how his childhood was fine. He, you know, had friends and he was, he's always described as this really charismatic character. Like he, none of the actors could possibly portray him properly because actors are real people. He's described as this sort of perfect saint-like type person when mm. he's young and when he's in his early teens and he's super benevolent, and everyone loves him, and he's super interesting. Benevolent sounds like an evil thing. Yeah, well, because malevolent actually sounds like it should be the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, that's a weird trick, the English it's like, language. Um, fuck. There's always a, there's a word that always makes me think that, uh, fuck, I can't come up with it. Reluctant. That, oh, that sounds like a good thing to me, but it's a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm pretty reluctant today. Yeah. Like it was What's the, wrong with you. The reason I didn't, the reason I found out it was a bad thing was the John Lejoie song. Is like he, he lent me my, I, I, he lent me DVDs and he was reluctant to do so. And I was like, that doesn't sound right. So I went and looked it up. <laughs> oh really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you gotta skip a word somehow. Mm-hmm. So the weird thing about this story is that his wife to be is his stepsister when he's young. Sorry, his wife. I have a problem with connections. So his wife, let me just write this down. Well, actually, let's go about it the other way. <laughs> he has a stepsister when he's young, and his parents intend for him and his stepsister to get married one day. Right, which is not that uncommon for 18, 19. Probably not. I mean, even people even married their first cousins back then. Ooh. But it's funny because now it's actually illegal in Canada to marry your stepsister. What? It's con- yeah, it's considered too close because it's like they consider it the same as a brother sister bond even though there's no blood there. Hmm. Yeah. That's really strange. Whereas you can't marry your f- or you can in fact marry your first cousin. What? Yeah. Fucking Canada. Well cuz well, I guess I guess you're not too closely related but I I mean that is uh up to everyone to decide. You're definitely we're getting off topic. We're getting <laughs> You're definitely closer related. To your first cousin than you are your stepsister. She's yeah. not even blood related. 
Well, they she could. Be, no, no, she can't be. They don't seem to have a problem with it because there's a lot of really colorful language in the book, and I can't tell if that's like period appropriate mm. or if it's just the way she wrote. But they often describe each other as playmates, which I know oh. is in the more yeah, I know is the innocent sense of the word. But they're also gonna get married, which makes me think that that's a very strange. I only think of the dirty. Version. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but they're great playmates, and. <laughs> When Frankenstein's young, he discovers uh, books. Well, the, the main guy that he reads is called Cornelius Agrippa. And I guess he was from like the 800s or something like that. He's very pre-science. And a lot of their ideas were for things like the elixir of life and you know, ways to become powerful and stuff like that. So it's mostly fantasy, but he gets so captivated in these books because he's reading them as if they're written contemporary oh and his dad and even his teachers later on don't really do a good job of explaining to him why you shouldn't just follow hundred thousand year old techniques uh and he goes off to university with that same mentality he wants to sort of incorporate what these old scientists did with what the new scientists are doing now Hmm. so he's kind of doing science fiction he's fringe science ever since the beginning of the book I like that. That's interesting. Yeah. So he goes off to university in Germany. The university is called Ingolstadt. Ingolstadt. I think so. I'm reading it from a book, so I'm Uh, guessing. I think you got it pretty good. (laughs) But uh, when he's there, he some of his teachers he likes, some of them they don't. uh, But his chemistry teacher shows him how to use a whole bunch of chemical apparatus. Mm -hmm. Apparatus. 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 So he has his laboratory, (laughs) (laughs) and. From there, I guess, he he sort of develops his own private laboratory because he's exceedingly wealthy. And you can tell that because he never does a day of honest work in the entire book mm. and somehow always has money. But he, yeah, he doesn't even dig it up in the book, right? Because he does in the movies. Yeah, it's usually, well, it's a corpse of the criminal in... Um, corpse of the criminal. Well, in the 1994 version. And that's that was what they were going with, was the idea that he used a criminal... And the criminal was hanged before he used his body to make the monster. Oh. So the idea is that's why he's evil and all this bad stuff. Hmm. But the book is a lot better at going through it. So when he finally gets all these tools and he's trying all these things, he discovers that he can bring life back to inanimate things. Wow. And once he discovers that, he decides, okay, I'm going to make a man. Because, I mean, that's the ultimate, right? If you can create life, why not create the same kind of life that you are? And this is where everything gets weird. First of all, it's never described in the book how he brings the monster to life. What's what's more than that, he even says to Walton, I'm not going to tell you what brings the monster to life because I don't want anybody else to try and do the same thing that I did. He didn't patent it so he could keep it secret. Exactly. Exactly. He's trying to hide it because he knows... You may think you want it, but you don't really want that's the secret. That's brilliant. That, yeah. Like, that part of it is actually fucking brilliant. Like, that, like, the movies from, uh, we're, our, like, we're not even, we're introducing the, the concept, and already I can see how little justice the movies have done, because they've taken that idea. It's like the fucking, the redux of, of uh, Star Wars 2, where instead of Luke silently falling after he finds out that, like, in the original, so, it, um... Darth Vader says, no, I am your father. And so Luke realizes he has two options, fall to his death or join the dark side. So he silently falls to his death. He, he, he jumps and falls quietly. And then the Millennium Falcon catches him. But he didn't know that. So it's, it's, a, it's a statement about Luke that he would rather die Stoic. peacefully than live in a chaotic situation. And then the Redux has him screaming. And it's like a cartoonish scream. It's like, ah! oh. <laughs> it's like, and that's a perfect example. You have this brilliant intellectual philosophy concept in the in the book, and then it's alive in the movies. And without, it's never even said in the book. Fuck. Not only is it not said in the book, it's actually it was put on the cover, the back cover, because it was like a it, it was like an article that saw you know like they always put quotes on mm-hmm. there. One of the quotes started with "It's alive." It's that's actually one of those premises, like the Neckbolts and Igor. They've become so big that they became part of Frankenstein, but they're not part of the real Frankenstein. I don't like that at all. Well, another thing was that uh, they they kind of they definitely went into this when it came to the Victor Frankenstein, the 2015 version. Okay, but they built the monster bigger in that one by giving it two sets of lungs, two hearts, Whoa. things like well to support the greater mass. 
Whereas it's the opposite in the book. In the book, he built it large because his tools were crude. So if he oh. wanted to, st- he had to stitch this monster together. So in order to do it, it was easier when all the pieces were larger because he had yeah. more space to work with. Fuck this! Bo- this book already sounds better. Someone needs to actually make a pr- like this. I know this Radcliffe one. Is this the closest? Not even close. No, Not even the, close. The, okay. The Radcliffe one is actually a pretty good movie. This is the 2015 one, mm-hmm. and. I liked it, but it had nothing to do with the book. It was really <laughs> only... And uh, Victor Frankenstein was nothing like himself. He's an asshole in that movie. Oh. A complete, utter, socially inept asshole, which is not Frankenstein. Huh. I just love James McAvoy, so I'm okay with that yeah, movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah McAvoy's cool. And then Radcliffe plays Igor? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Does, he play, like, does he play a good Igor? I think he did a damn good job, yeah. Yeah, that movie was well done. It's just that when you read the book... Just like you, the whole time I've been thinking, God damn, I could make a movie out of this. All you have to do is stay true to the book and the movie makes itself. Maybe we can, maybe we'll make a, like a proper uh, animated short. Well, if anyone here is listening to this and they have, you know, production powers for a movie, give me a call. I'm not going to put my phone number out there, but you know where our YouTube channel is. <laughs> give me a call. <laughs> so he creates this monster, brings it to life through God knows what means, and... Then he's horrified all of a sudden because now this sort of like weird, decrepit face like we were talking about in the Mm. 1994 movie, it's now alive and looking at him. But it's not moving. It doesn't know what to do. It doesn't have any data yet. Yeah. So he kind of panics and he just leaves. He just thinks, all right, well, I'll just it's strapped down to the table. I'll just get the fuck out of here. I'll clear my head and come back. Wow. And when he's leaving, he actually runs into one of his childhood friends. He's like really good friend, Henry. And he oh, happens. I remember Henry. Yeah, he's arriving at the school to learn. So mm. Frankenstein runs into him somewhere in the street, and they get to talking. And he goes, "Oh shit, I can't bring him back to my place." Like you know, it's like having a chick in your place. You got to get out of there. Like I got this fucking monster in my laboratory. Don't you just hate it? Taking when you up the whole place. Bring friends home because you got a fucking monster that you brought back to life. <laughs> but sure enough, he goes up to his laboratory, and there's nothing there. Oh, no. It's gone. And no, he doesn't freak out at all. Oh. He's just like, oh, well. Problem that pro- Yeah, that problem's not in my no, life it's, anymore. It's always the Frankenstein's monster you don't see. That's the... <laughs> For everyone you don't see, there's one out there somewhere. <laughs> there's, it's like cockroaches. There's 200 that you don't see. Exactly. And I guess, I guess because he's so delirious, he's been working so hard, and he was so freaked out that he's, like, relieved rather than freaked out that this monster is on the loose. And he doesn't even consider it a monster yet because he doesn't even know what it's capable of so that's that's what all of that happens he just stays at school with his buddy and wow he just forgets does, yeah it. he just doesn't even think of them all he's like yeah it's out in nature probably died eh, it's probably fine yeah, it doesn't go looking for the body nothing wow yeah and i guess part of it is he doesn't want people to know so he can't like tell his friend like hey let's go shoot some eight foot tall dude that yeah. i made right well he would rather just fall in the ocean and disappear or something exactly like that, right? well because it doesn't know what it's doing i guess he assumes uh because I remember, I recall that kind of that happening in the De Niro one. Does he, because I remember, I remember De Niro escaping and talking to a little, a little kid in the yeah. streets, which I actually felt like was probably one of the, like the redeemable parts of the De Niro one is that they, they make him seem like a real person when he's talking to that kid, which I think is probably some sort of like statement about like, like kids don't have that same, um, Interesting, because that's actually a point of the novel. Oh, but it's done the opposite way. I should clarify: like, kids don't kids don't have a preconceived idea of what is good and evil. Mm-hmm. So, f- for a child to meet Frankenstein's monster would be—I almost said Frankenstein. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be as bad as if an adult ran into him. Yeah, and a lot of movies do that, where they they put the kid in there to like to demonstrate humanity. But this whole movie is about. Or this whole like idea is like what is human, what is what is not, not human, what is what is what is life? Can life succeed if it's made by life as opposed to just like naturally done? The answer to that is probably no. <laughs> just, <laughs> just based off you know Spoiler, trial and error. Spoiler alert! <laughs> doesn't work out. So after a while, they decide, okay, well, it's good time. Let's go back to Geneva. And, oh, sorry, I, they're from Geneva, Switzerland. That's his hometown. 
Is that where the um, Geneva Accords were made? The, yeah. Yes. And the convention? Yeah. yeah. Is I'm guessing a, because is, of Frankenstein, could probably? Could it be? No. That would be very interesting. Well, Geneva is, uh, I'm pretty sure, a very affluent, wealthy city in Switzerland. Mm. And Switzerland, yeah. Do they emulate something? Like, why like, we're getting off topic? Well, Switzerland's is... a really good place, just in general. Oh. They, well, they're, they're fairly small. I believe it's a Scandinavian country. You know, up in like Finland mm. and that kind of area, and they are generally have always had really good healthcare, really good, um, you know, military, uh, public relations. They've they've just always been like a very peaceful, nice place to live. I think that's one of the reasons they do it there. Do you want to go there? Yeah, let's, you know, let's go to <laughs> let's go there. You know, it's fuck, mountainous. Fuck this podcast. Let's go to Switzerland. Let's go to Switzerland now. Right now. Yeah, we need a Switzerland travel agent. If anyone yes out there, Switzerland Quest. Colon, search for the uh, Swiss booking agent. <laughs> search for Victor Frankenstein. <laughs> so they, they're about to go back to Geneva, and then they get a letter from Frankenstein's father, and it says that Frankenstein's brother's dead. Oh, no. And he's been murdered. No! No! <laughs> There's actually certain parts in this book that made me sit up. Yeah. I think, I think this is probably one of them. I've done that. I, I'm not a reader, but the book Aragon, like that final battle, if you, if you watch the movie, fuck the movie. Read the book, or just skip to that the the chapter about the final battle. It's unbelievably well detailed. Like I was like so excited to go into that movie, and it didn't even happen. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, they so they have to go back, obviously, with more haste. They have to sort of decide what they're going to oh, do. When right. They, get they there. can't just fly back. Then. Yeah. Well, they <laughs> I, they usually just go on on horseback or by carriage, like most of the. So it's Frankenstein. Is this, is the is the set. story set roughly in, when in Shelley's time? That's actually really funny. It even tells oh, you shit. What? I just made a connection. I don't know how much I should say. No, you know it's fine. Hemlock Grove. How much have you seen of that? None. There's a there's a there's a character. Her name is Shelley, and she dies and she's reborn as basically a Frankenstein's monster. Whoa. And her yeah, her name is Shelley. That is. Yeah, that is, that's a hundred percent an illusion. Hundred yeah. percent a um, a, like a call or a, an homage. That's awesome because like it happens this like it happens on like a stormy night with lightning and all that shit. Of course, lightning doesn't do it, but it's actually science. But um, but yeah, wow, that's fucking brilliant. It's honestly, and that's a book too. It's based on a book. That's why knowing. Like that's why reading these old stories is so great because they've been yeah. re-referenced so many times throughout just culture history. Well, and there's quiet references and a lot of exactly a lot of cartoons and stuff. Sometimes it's, I prefer the quiet references. Yeah, because car- well, cartoon people are always inspired by like one back. So or, or everyone's inspired by one back. Like you and I find Joe Rogan funny, but not really Richard Pryor funny. But Joe finds. Richard Pryor hilarious because he was from that time. Yeah, and Richard Pryor probably has an inspiration before that that we wouldn't find funny. Lenny and Bruce jo- and Joe probably exactly. Although Lenny Bruce is hilarious, but um, yeah, it's it's very interesting when you go back and cartoonists are always inspired by the previous animators. And if you've read this book, man, you'd be inspired by it too. It's, it's yeah, it's well, short. Already it's it's got... only like two hundred and thirty-five pages. That's two hundred and thirty-four more than I would get through. <laughs> I usually like reading the the intro, and I'm like, well, that was fun. Well, I mean, that's that's actually why I wanted to read this one, is I could, I, I'm even thinking of reading Harry Potter, mm. but goddamn, is that a long investment? Because the books get bigger, and there's seven of them. Yep. Whereas Frankenstein, you read it start to finish, you get everything out of it. Yeah. And then you make a podcast, right? Yeah. So, so when Frankenstein goes home to his murdered brother, yeah. um, he also finds out that one of his really close family friends is on trial for the murder. Shit. So it's one of those life shattering moments. And when he returns, he wants to go and search the area where his brother died because he essentially needs closure. But when he's doing that on a lightning filled night, it's really awesome. There's a lot of lightning in the movie. Yeah. Like when he's a kid, lightning strikes a tree and just eviscerates it. Um, and then there's lightning probably three or four more times at really impactful parts of the story. But it's not how they bring him alive. I will say again, that is not hmm. how they bring him to life. That's probably where the inspiration came from. Exactly. It probably is an, a, a nod to the book, but still, like, you've gone out of your... You've gone a different direction. Well, it's like the new Star Treks. Like, they're not... They have all the names, 
and it's the idea of going into space. But Star Trek, the 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 original two series were about philosophy, while as the new ones are action. And I think that's part of the problem is that most people watching a movie would say, "Well, how did they even bring the monster to life?" Yeah. Well, that's why you just have to have the scene where Frankenstein goes, no, I'm not going to tell you how I made a horrible monster. Well, you could totally start the movie without, like, you wouldn't need to start it with, I guess we're trying to make it as much like the book as possible. So you could start it with that framing device of the... of the. the but even if you didn't, you could just have Frankenstein narrate and he would just say... You could do that. I, I've heard two on two occasions or two different movies where someone is narrating and they say, you probably think that because I'm narrating this... That I live at the end, that I'm alive at the end, and like, and sometimes those characters actually die. That just means you're silly. Voice actors are not characters. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Kevin Conroy. I don't give a shit about your fucking B man. Um, I like Kevin Conroy. Just to clarify, I think he's really nice. I mean, I don't know him, but anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, K man, if you're out there, uh, what the fuck was I trying to say? You got no feet to stand on, though. Yeah. Oh, We're sitting, though, so that's okay. <laughs> so you're not going to fall over, at least. <laughs> well, during one of these lightning-filled nights, lightning. he's skulking around, looking for where his brother was murdered, and he sees this crazy, shadowy figure, which doesn't look like a person, and it climbs what is essentially a cliff. It climbs a mountain on a vertical face. Oh, no. And just disappears out of sight. And he immediately thinks... I know exactly what the fuck that is. Oh, this is this movie's this book is way better than the movie. Absolutely, like it's better than any story I've ever heard. Well, from, he, from Frankenstein, he knows immediately that the monster did it, even though he doesn't actually have any evidence to link them. He's instantly gripped with the idea that the oh, monster I created no. is destroying my life. So re- even before they start to look at evidence or he hears any information, he already knows that the monster did it. Oh, and it did it on purpose. So, is that really? Did I, did I ruin that's where it? we're going. No, that's where we're going. <laughs> See, the thing is, I figured that out without knowing, so it's not really a spoiler. Because, like, yeah. like, that's probably the logical conclusion most readers would go for. Like, they'd be like, ooh, did he? Did it, was that intentional? Well, that's what I thought. I thought that's a kind of a weird jump to make. Just because the monster's there doesn't mean he was the murderer. Well, the only reason I thought that it was him was because you said they had to travel. If his brother lived in the same town, I probably wouldn't have come up with that idea. But if the if the monster is also far away where his family happens to be, that's the only reason why I made that. It's conclusion. sketchy, right? Yeah. It's like why is this thing yeah. two countries away, you know, happened to be around where my brothers died. Yeah. And the weird thing that that goes on is that they then move to a trial and he can't really say much because he can't say mm. I created some horrible disfigured monster that killed my brother and framed this girl because yeah. everyone would be like okay lock him the fuck up and let's <laughs> go back to the trial <laughs> yeah. right and the trial plays out kind of just like you'd imagine the the woman says everything she can but obviously there's no other witnesses and this is the 1800s so their prison system or not their prison their justice system is kind of shaky yeah so one thing leads to another she gets executed for the crime oh shit yeah so frankenstein's obviously reeling from this the whole family is sort of in disarray and so i I don't know i don't know if anything really happens to the family everyone is just super down because this is a really positive family and they've just had two deaths essentially yeah all at once so frankenstein kind of goes wandering off just to get some space because You know, if you can't talk to anyone about this, you don't want to be around people you can't talk to. Uh And he's just climbing in the mountains of Geneva because it's a super mountainous area. And when he gets to the top of this one mountain, there's this frozen lake of ice. And he sees this figure just bombing it across the lake. Like, the monster is usually described as moving many times faster than a person. Hmm. Yeah, like, he could probably outrun a horse, I'd imagine, just from the descriptions that I hear in a book. Because he's always depicted as slow moving and stupid. But he's actually incredibly powerful, incredibly strong, and really agile. Fuck. And they even, they describe his limbs as, his limbs and his joints as being supple, which means that they move really easily. So I think because he was designed so big, he was also designed really well. Wow. Yeah, so he just runs right up to Frankenstein and doesn't even try to hurt him. He at no point in, in the book at all tries to attack Frankenstein. Really? Yeah, so he just comes up to him and he says, like, basically, look, we gotta talk. And he speaks. Holy shit. He speaks very well, too. He's a, he seems like a well-read person. Yeah. Um, and so 
Frankenstein tries to attack him and the monster just avoids him and says, like, listen, will you just calm down and let me tell you my story? And after a while, Frankenstein realizes, like, I can't fight a nine foot tall giant. So, yeah, I'll listen to your story. Sure. I would have made that distinction when he was across the lake. (laughs) Well, I'm not going to fight that. (laughs) Yeah. So that's basically sort of where the monster goes into his story. And this is now when you have a story within a story within a story. Whoa. Because Walton is telling a story to his sister of Frankenstein telling him a story about the monster telling him about what happened. Wow. Which is going way beyond Hamlet. But like, generally that's like against convention of storytelling. But was this done well? It's interesting because every single word in the book is told from someone to someone. And that someone is not you. They're not narrating. So the monster is telling Frankenstein, and Frankenstein is telling Walton, and Walton is telling his sister. Hmm. So it works really well because it feels like it's addressed to you, even though it's actually addressed to another character. It's it's amazing that you're able that someone's able to do it. It was done well though, right? Yeah, well, because they they framed them all as letters. Every single chapter was a letter, which meant that if there was quotations. It was something being said by the monster. So if there's quotes around the whole paragraph, oh, cool. whereas if it's just written, it's Frankenstein talking to Walton. So I, I felt that it was pretty easy to understand who was talking and what they were talking about. That's amazing because I was just thinking about it. As many times as I've seen Batman Begins with uh, Neeson's and uh, Bale, every time he tells the story, like the you know when they're sitting on the lake... And and uh, after what's his name goes in, it goes in, and then they're they're sitting there, and they're it flashes back to Bruce almost killing that guy who killed his parents. Yeah, that scene is so long. Every single time I watch it, I forget it's a flashback, and then so it goes from that and just cuts back to him and Neeson on the on the lake. And every single time I watch it, I'm like, fuck, this wasn't an origin. This was a this was a flashback. It's too long. Like, it needed to be shortened, or it needed a cutback or something, but that's, it's amazing that someone's able to do a double, a double flashback, and you're still aware of it, even though every time I watch Batman Begins, I forget we're watching a flashback. Yeah, and this is all in written form, too. And in 18... In 1800s, yeah. Jesus. So what happens with the monster is that he essentially breaks out of his restraints because he's way stronger than anyone had predicted he'd be. And he just grabs some sort of a cloak that he finds and just leaves, just hightails it out of there because... He has no idea what's going on at all. Yeah. Um, and the, it's super interesting hearing how the monster describes his first experiences because there's things like he talks about this glowing ball in the sky that mm. if he looks at it, it hurts him. And then there's this other glowing orb that guides him at night, which is the moon. Oh. And there's so many things like the, um, the screams of birds. Like he's understanding these things in their most basic form. Yeah. That's... And he has no language either to express that. In uh, probably one of my favorite jokes in Fallout 3 was one of the things you can tell somebody when you first leave the vault is that, like, that big room out there is amazing. How did you get, like, like how much time does it take to replace that gigantic light bulb? Like, oh, this, no. This person's lived there, and they were born and lived to, like, 1820 in eight, 18 or 20 years. Yeah, years old is what I meant. Inside, they're in a vault their whole life. So when they go outside, that's not considered outside to them. That's just a bigger room, a much larger room. Yeah. Wow. Which is crazy because really, outside, like we're more. It's more like we are inside outside. Like we look at it as being like a different thing. Almost like when we look at space is out there. No, you're in space. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the the way we choose to define being outside is simply the same as like we choose to put clothing on it's like are you sheltered or are you not sheltered well, i think it's a perception thing like it's like, or, yeah. or your perspective sorry which is which is why when when uh, the monster um is learning things from the very first time it's like an adult with the ideas of a child but when a child discovers these things they don't talk so they like a child gets all this information for i don't know how like what when do children start talking two or three yeah two or three something like that so you got two years of recording information before you actually verbalize it. So that's very interesting that, that the monster would be verbalizing the ideas almost like in this situation. And he has a fully developed brain. That's the key. He oh. is he is not growing. He begins at full size with no information. Ooh. So he really quickly figures out that certain things he can eat, certain things he can't eat, 
and the ground is cold and it's not comfortable to sleep there and he he innately knows that he needs shelter Mm -hmm. so the first thing he tries to do is go into human homes and obviously they just all freak out and run away because he's this monster (laughs) yeah and after a while he goes okay humans do not like me yeah people don't like good thing to know so he stumbles upon this cottage which has i don't even know how to describe it uh, but it's essentially just sort of a, a pig pen that's on the back of the cottage, but there's no pigs in it. It's just sort of an enclosed area that's not yeah. connected to the indoors. And so he hides in there, and then he just kind of closes it up from the inside. So he just sort of lays boards and rocks and stones so that any little holes are covered. So he actually has essentially his own home connected to this other home. And they just don't notice that shit? They do, well, they don't use it. They're not very... Oh. Um, well, it's not that they're not good farmers. They're just not very wealthy farmers. Mm. Uh, so you, you actually come to hear a lot about these people with time. And he's actually able to watch them through a tiny little hole in the wall. Mm. Um, I think that sounds very familiar. Yeah, that is actually done in the Mary Shelley one where he's sort of lying in this hovel and he can see into the house. Right, right. And the, the mechanism they use in that to teach him how to read and write is uh, there's a little girl who lives there, and the grandfather is teaching the little girl how to read and write and stuff like that. Oh, that's a good that's a good device. It's a great device, but it's not as good as the one in the book. So what happens is the monster gets used to these people. He realizes that the man always has to go out and cut wood, and it takes him forever, and then he doesn't have time to do other stuff. So at night, he starts cutting wood for him. And that's what starts to freak out the cottagers, because they're just like, why is there always wood when we need it? <laughs> But you know what? When you're struggling and you have nothing to eat, you just you just take it. You just do, you know, you're just like, well, there's going to be wood there every day. I'm, yeah. I'm just going to trust that. Some good Samaritan. Um, and the monster even goes from stealing their food to actually eating off um, like nuts and berries and things because he realizes that they don't have enough food to feed themselves. Wow. Yeah. So after after a long time of this happening and he learns the basic things, you know, he learns what milk and cheese and mother and father. He doesn't know that mother and father are relationships. He only knows like this person Mm. is called mother. This person is called sister. Right. He almost thinks of them as names at first. Yeah. No, that's uh, yeah, that's really smart. But then come like he doesn't find this out till later. But the cottagers are uh, a French family. And uh, I forget what the De Lacy is the name of the old man. That's mm. what he keeps calling them. De Lacy. De Lacy, yeah. And so what happened was they were in France and some sort of Turkish merchant got into a bunch of trouble for something he shouldn't have. So he was being persecuted for nothing. And mm. this family tried to help him and they did help him get out of prison. But in the process, they themselves were exiled from the country. So that's why they're living in Germany near Ingolstadt. Mm. And so now that he discovers this... Or no, he doesn't discover this, but the merchant had a daughter, and that daughter was promised to the man who lives in this house. That was the idea. Like, you break me out of prison, I'll give you my daughter. Oh. Kind of scuzzy, kind of weird. Yeah. Especially because she doesn't even speak the language. She doesn't even speak French. Well, that's really scuzzy anytime you promise a human but being. They, well, they, <laughs> they met, and they knew each other, and they liked each other. Like, they had interpreters back in France. So, um, sorry, from, from Shelley's point of view in 1819, is that... The, is this the the, the, the giving of a, of a person to another? Is that some sort of um, idea or theme to prove a point? Or is that just how things like, were? For, from her perspective, is that just a thing that happens? Or does she use it as uh, like to, to um, describe her issue with the idea? It's... Uh... It's a slightly complicated situation because the father does promise his daughter to Felix. That's the name of the guy who lives Mm. at the cottage. But Felix meets this daughter and they get to know each other through interpreters and they like each other. Oh, okay. Um, The daughter, in fact, is the father tries to take her away and not let her go see Felix after he's broken out of prison. And the daughter's like, yeah, fuck that. What an ass. Well, that's the thing. He he just wanted to get out of prison. He would have done anything, right? Wait, well, and he gives up his daughter, and then he tells her to won't no. let her. Yeah, fuck, go to the person she loves. So after a while, she shows up at this cottage in Germany. She finally is oh. able to make it there, and she doesn't speak the language. She speaks uh, Turkish. I that guess I don't know if that's tough. a language. Um, it is a little tough, but what's fortunate about it is they 
teach her how to speak English. Because she was, she was about 200 years late on uh, Google Translate. Exactly. <laughs> so so they go to teach her. They think, you know, like, we've got to get her up to speed. We can't just keep, like, waving and stuff. So the old man goes about teaching this girl. This yeah. Her name's Safi. He goes about teaching her how to speak French. And in the process, the monster is able to oh. learn through the hole in the window. Or a hole in the wall. 200 years Early, sorry. Not too late. <laughs> Google Translate, that's so 1600s, dude. You still into that? And I like the child thing, the teaching of a child, mm. but you can only teach a child so much. You have to go back to, like, cat, tree, right. bird. But when you're teaching an adult, they already have a language, so you're kind of just trying to get them to track that language to a new one. That's, that's why you can tell where someone came from based on how their accent sounds. Yeah, because everything is molded after your first language. It's like what's well, like um, like jalapeno, is a J. So when that person learns English, they like they'll call something like that. Like they won't pronounce the J. They'll call it like, um, like so when someone's name is Jack, they'll be like hello, ha, yak, yak, like yak, or like or like his yacht, his his jot. Like like they they pronounce the Y with the J. It makes sense. Yeah. And I think it was really cool because she's learning and it's obviously hard for her to learn a totally new language, Mm -hmm. but the monster never learned a language. So for him, it's really easy. It's the first time and he has a fully developed brain to do it with. So he learns really quickly, probably even learns faster than she does how to speak the language. What language was Shelly, did Shelly speak? That is a really good question. I always assumed English, but I have no idea. It probably wasn't. If it was, or, oh, oh, could have been because they lived in Switzerland. Oh, okay. So I think there's, it might have been. I think yeah. So I'm just curious if you're yeah. reading a translation. I don't think it's a translation because I even know that Mary Shelley. It never expressly says that it's not. So it very well could be. Hmm. Yeah, felt very English, but I mean that a good translation should. Yeah. Right. Yeah, localization. So, is wow, a, is a tough, tough thing. That's why there's certain things <clears throat> sonic. Who uh, come out really weird, and you're like, that that doesn't quite uh, sound like English. That's not how people talk. But yeah, if you if you read a whole book and it sounded good, it's, it could be could be either one actually. Yeah, that'd be interesting to find out because maybe the one you read isn't even uh, yeah, isn't true. even the original. Yeah, the the language was very fanciful, and it kind of really kept with the way that the monster also spoke. And they even go as far as to sort of teach you how the monster learned. Yeah. So he learned from them the basics. And then he also learned because they would read books. But he actually found books in the forest at one point. Um, Paradise Lost was one of them. Um, I don't actually know what the other two books that he that read. so 18, 19. Well, it was from a traveler, <laughs> right? One of those things like, you know, if you're, if you're injured somewhere yeah. out in the forest, you need to get the hell out of there. And you've got like 100 pounds worth of books. Fuck those books. I'm getting back to the city. That's how people used to... That's where you used to keep your porn. When you didn't have... You couldn't put it under your bed if you're living in a cottage with a bed and a table. You had to keep that shit in a a tree or something. And then people find your porn and suddenly there's a page missing and you're like, the fuck is this shit? Yeah, I mean, they might as well have taken the whole thing. Kept the document together. (laughs) Jesus. Bring it back when you're done. Yeah. So he learns all this stuff and becomes, I guess, acclimated to their language. And then he decides, okay... I've been helping these people. They don't know it. But if I can find a way to introduce myself to them, maybe they'll accept me. Maybe they'll be okay with me because I'm help- helping them. And it works out okay because he he decides to talk to the old man. So I haven't mentioned this yet, but the old man is blind. And he figures this out pretty early because oh. he, he obviously doesn't do anything where he can see. That's brilliant. There's even a scene where uh, this girl is crying and he says... The girl begins to cry, but the man only notices when she cries audibly. So that's the first clue you get that he's blind. And then oh. the monster himself sort of figures it out as time So when she's on. just tearing up, he doesn't know. Can't but see only it. Only when she sobs. Ooh. Yeah. It's fucking movie. It's fucking show. I wish it was a movie. It you know, should be. You know what it might it might even do be better is a is a short like a ten episode miniseries because that it would, would be better. It, yeah. It would give it an opportunity to really delve into the the concept because from this like. Do you think a 200-ish page book could be turned into 10 episodes? Would that be too much? Six might be better. Six, yeah. Yeah, well, because I think a whole episode should be maybe even two, the monster story. Yeah. Start to finish. Woo! That's, that's a great idea. 
the miniseries. And I think that would be the only way to present it. Because a full TV show, you're going too far. Yeah. And a movie, I mean, we've seen time and time again, you cannot compress everything that's important down into a movie. It would need to be like two and a half hours. Or maybe like three or four. Ooh. I'd do a four-hour movie. Just two watch parter. it in two parts. Yeah, two parter, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The only thing about a two-part movie is that it has to have a beginning and an end. The yeah. first one, even though there's no... There's, no to, one puts an ending in the middle of their book. You have to write it in there, and that's... Yeah. And yeah. then you really don't want to be like an intermission, like, put in disc two. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he actually finds pages in um, the cloak that he just took from Frankenstein, mm. had some journal pages in it. And he now knows how to read those journal pages. So he figures out... The really basic idea, he knows that Frankenstein is some scientist who did something, and it describes how Frankenstein made him. It describes the days leading up to him becoming alive. And it also, in it, mentions Geneva. It mentions, like, my home country, Geneva. So that's the only info the monster has to go off about his creator. But it doesn't... It it does it, does it at any point in the book actually describe how he came to life? No. So they leave that to the audience i love that exactly i love that confidence yeah well and i think that it makes more sense that someone so completely destroyed by this would be unwilling to allow other people to go down that path yeah right not even here's a warning here's how to do it i'm just not going to let you i'm just not going to make it an option for you to do it because i know it's not worth it yeah wow that's I love how this is what this is so much more of a this is a philosophy um story the whole thing it was like the um they marketed splice as a horror movie it was so obviously a philosophy movie it was like a horror movie in the last 15 minutes before that it was like what does it mean to be a human should you make human life like <laughs> yeah it was mostly it was mostly even thriller like it but there's that, a lot of things that could classify as horror that aren't like this is this was supposed to be a horror novel yeah but it's more like the ideas are scarier than anything exactly that, to me to me it, it's it's kind of a weird trade-off because a game that has psychological horror can stop being scary after you've played it too much but jump scares are always scary as, if they're done really effective but jump scares are cheap mm-hmm. so it's weird it's like you kind of have to have a balance and the same thing with movies but for a book, it can't really jump scare you. So it, it has to rely on its ideas. On the ideas being creepy. And I think, like, the what I was saying about confidence, the nowadays, a lot of stories, even the smart ones, uh, do these, like, weird little spoon-fed moments where, like, if you weren't paying attention, let's remind you, oh, and by the way, this happened. And there's a... There's, I get when you want to turn a story into a marketable thing and it needs to be successful in order to continue the art form. But this book really seems like it was way more about the art than anything else. It doesn't seem like she was trying to make money when she wrote it. It sounds like she was possessed the same way Frankenstein was with this really weird, um, sort of obscene concept. Because the idea of making a life and then not supporting that life to the point where it takes on its own form Ooh. is a really dark idea. It might actually be a commentary on on parenting. And in some ways it is. There's actually a lot of there's a lot of commentaries that show up more than once. Like the um, the person being accused of a murder they didn't commit. Yeah. And it all being a result of the monster who's like an extension of Victor. That comes up more than once in the book. It'll come up later. Very nice. So there's, yeah, there's certain things you can tell she was trying to point out. And the monster is cool because, like I said, it's grown. It's mm-hmm. fully grown when he releases it. And, well, it actually, so it goes to try and meet the, this family. And it meets the old blind man when everyone else is gone. Because he can just come in and be like, oh, yeah. hey, I'm a traveler. I oh. can speak English. Let me touch or, your face. French or whatever. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to touch my I got, face. I got a rash. Uh... Yeah, and they have a good conversation. It's a very, that's actually a very touchy conversation. That would be one scene that I would almost put into a, a movie or a series verbatim because the way he's speaking is so urgent. He's talking about how he's a traveler, but how he has these uh, protectors that he's going to meet. And the man's confused because he only has little bits of information that he mm. can put together. 
and are the protectors that people that, in the that, cottage that, that in the cottage yeah yeah and at one point the monster even says um you know i've thrown myself upon your will like don't deny me and the old man says i wouldn't deny you and he like he's on his knees in front of the old man and that's when the other people come home the people who can see how freakish he is oh. so they obviously freak out because they think that their dad is about to be mauled by this like bear person yeah and so they attack him and he just he has to just get out of there i mean it doesn't have to he's actually so he even says in that scene i could rip Felix into pieces if mm-hmm. I wanted to, but yeah, I don't yeah. want to. So he leaves and he's thinking, you know, I, I just got to get out of here. So he gets as far out of there as he can. But when he comes back, he sort of changes his mind. He turns around and comes back to the farm. And everyone's gone. It's completely empty. Oh, shit. And so he's kind of hiding in his hovel again. And I guess just gathering all his stuff. And he sees Felix come back with a couple other people. And he's like... No, I know I've paid for the cottage for another six months, but I'm not interested. Like, I just take it, give it to someone else. Like, I have to leave. Like, me and my family are leaving. There's no way we're coming back to this cottage. Yeah. And so the monster gets really pissed and burns the whole thing to the ground. Oh, just seems yeah. like a pretty level that situation. Well, or and he, he doesn't even, it's not like, you know, like, oh, poor gasoline all over the place and set a match. Like, he couldn't do that. So he had to gather dry sticks and leaves. Oh, and so, so he literally made the place more flammable by not, bringing in flammable material. As opposed to like most of the time it's like a crime of passion. Like in the moment he actually had to plan. Out. Probably took hours. <laughs> like and the whole time he's like, is this a, is this a good decision? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck decision. this place. Yeah. Fuck, it, yeah, <laughs> fuck it, Get the Tinder together. And then in that, like after that, he just decides I have no home. I'm going to go to Geneva. I have nowhere. Geneva, Victor. Yeah. And that's actually a cool trip because he generally can't be out in the daytime when people could see him. So a oh. lot of his travel is at night or early in the morning. So this whole thing is still leading. This is all leading up to to meeting Victor, right? Yes. Yes. His whole so this, story goes straight through to the, the meeting where he's telling him about it. Right. So this is a flashback. So we already know he gets to Geneva. So it's more like a, like the story of what happens in between. Exactly. Yeah. So it was about a year and a half or two years that he lived in that cottage. Oh, okay. It's a long process of him learning and growing and, and just becoming the monster he actually is in the end. Yeah. So on the trip, uh, there's a little girl that trips and almost drowns in this ravine and he saves her from the ravine, but is then shot by her father Oh, for obvious reasons because he's freaked out by this bear man. Or just really didn't want to hear any more um, Maroon 5. I guess, yeah, just not having it. So That was a Levine reference. <laughs> fine i wasn't sure if you got that i realize now that i've said it that his name is not adam ravine adam ravine <laughs> you know what you can suggest that to him so this just adds to how much the monster doesn't like people because all he's thinking is i help you you hit me with a stick i help your daughter you shoot me that's a pretty common i i could have sworn i just saw something like that like a guy helps somebody out and he gets shot it is actually a very common premise, the idea yeah. that you're helping, but someone is not realizing that you're helping and they overreact. Well, part of why people got this far is because they destroy everything that scares them. Exactly. Like, we eradicate. Like, didn't, didn't the saber-toothed tiger exist at one point with people? And we just destroyed yeah, it? Long time. Well, a lot of other things destroyed it, too. That's true. But also part of it is, imagine there was this giant ape creature. I want to take that thing into a museum and get paid money for it. Right, so there's a oh. lot of... Like, I don't know if that was the motivation of the father. He's probably just trying to protect his daughter. But there's a lot of reasons mm. why people wouldn't be kind to this strange abnormality. You know what I'm, what I'm, uh, what I'm realizing? The similarities here? What's that? <laughs> it's Harambe. Oh my god. We're going there. Looks okay. like the giant ape creature saves a small child and gets shot as a result. It's That's I mean, it's, what you're thinking of. That's what it's from. You know what? Everyone who's listening to this, dicks out for Harambe. Dicks out I'm for just saying Harambe. That. Fucking um, microaggressions. I, we're we're going to get really sidetracked just for a second here. I was even talking about this with someone yesterday. They said, why is it that people are still talking about Harambe, even though it was, you know, it's, it's a gorilla at a zoo? Yeah. And I said, well... Everyone can see this from a totally omniscient perspective in a way. We understand 
everything that went on. So yeah. we know that there was just this ape who was put in a cage and then some fuck let their kid fall into this cage. Yep. And in trying to protect that kid, this ape gets shot. We can all identify with that. Because let's say you're someone who doesn't speak the language and you're in a country and you see a kid who's in danger and you try and help them, but they don't understand what you're saying and then you get shot. Mm -hmm. That could totally happen. The only difference is that this is a 400 pound creature that can crush a two ton truck if it wanted to. In, yeah, in the situation, Harambe had like almost no, he like the only option he had is if he just ignored the child. If he like picked it up and booked it to the other side of the of the enclosure and like sat down with his hands over his eyes like he like he pretty much had he, it made sense he's in a tiny cage all day with nothing happening and suddenly a thing falls into it and it's alive and then there's all these people screaming, screaming. yeah you don't even know, you don't know what to do you don't, you don't know, know they're, why they're if, screaming if they're telling you if this is good if this is bad it's like when you just yell at a dog and you don't explain the problem that's a it's rough. It's probably why they talked about it. Well, and you've said this before, but it's the internet's way of healing. It's talking way, about yeah. something, yeah. You need to discuss it. We almost need to beat the meme to the point, like, you know, beating a dead horse. Yeah. To the point where it becomes just natural. Everyone goes, yeah, the Harambe situation. Like, we understand it. We've gotten past it. But we haven't done that yet. We can't get past it in that short period of time. It only happened at the start of this summer. Yeah. Here we are dating the podcast. No, that's fine. Well, I mean, we already dated it at 1919. <laughs> Everybody knows it happened after that. <laughs> yep. So Harambe makes it to Geneva. Sorry. The monster makes it to Geneva. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is what you were talking about earlier, about how the young child won't have like the disposition to hate as much. Right. And he sees this young child and he goes oh, hey, like, this kid might not freak out because he hasn't been indoctrinated with the idea that big monsters are scary, mm -hmm. I guess. And so he goes up to the kid, and he essentially kind of grabs him, and the kid freaks out of course. for obvious reasons. Yeah. Because I don't really... I think it's a baby would probably still freak out. Yeah. I mean, this monster. And uh, so he kind of grabs him, and he's, like, kind of trying to tell him, like, no, like, I'm not trying to hurt you. And then the kid goes... My dad is whatever Frankenstein, and he owns a castle. And the monster goes, oh, oh, you're Frankenstein's kid. I see now. He goes, like, you are the son of my enemy. And he essentially just kills him. What? He strangles him, the boy. Because... What? Did, did we already know that his kid died? Well, see, this is, this is the thing. His Frankenstein's last name. Oh, shit. Right? So this is Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein's father that he's talking about. This is Victor Frankenstein's brother he's run into. Oh. And he didn't know who it was. Shit. And all he thinks is, I've been persecuted for so long because of this one person. And this is, this is his opportunity to hurl a stone back. Oh, so the brother that was killed was a, was a child. A young boy. Oh, okay. I imagine yeah. him as being like similar age, but... Yeah, I, the, something about the timeline didn't make much sense to me. He had been gone to school for like five years, but his brother was five years old, and yet he seemed to be close with this brother. I was like, I don't, I don't know how that works. I don't know. I guess they had a lot of time back then to write letters, talk to each other. And... <laughs> <laughs> so when when he does this, the the boy is wearing a locket that he was given by the um, the wife to be for Victor Frankenstein, mm -hmm. and so the monster snatches it. Mostly because he has no possessions, and the boy doesn't need it anymore. Yeah. And it's somewhere later on that he discovers this woman walking around looking for the boy, because she doesn't know where the boy was killed. She doesn't know that she's near the site, so she's just looking. And uh, a storm brews, so she has to take refuge in just some sort of a cottage, so she's sleeping. And so the monster goes in there, and... He recognizes her in the pendant because the pendant is actually a picture of her. Mm. It's one of those things. It's like a family heirloom type thing. Yeah. It's either of her or of the sister. I don't remember. But he knows that she will be blamed if he leaves the locket on her. Oh. The monster is already advanced to that point where he understands the, the way wow. things work. Because he's read books about politics and about kingdoms and about the world. So he plants that on her. Because she's near the site, 
and she has the locket on her. So everyone's obviously going to believe that she was the one who did it. Wow. Yeah, and then he basically says, this is now him talking directly to Frankenstein. He says, I did this because of what you did to me. And you've made me so isolated and alone that you're making me want to continue to do this. Like, you're generating this anger in me. So really, this this whole thing seems to be a statement about the potential for your indirect actions. Absolutely. Well, it's also a statement for taking care of things, right? Yes, you, that you respond. You're not, it's not only your uh, right to something when you create it, but your responsibility. Absolutely. And this is all from a time when it didn't have very strong morals. That's actually amazing. Yeah. That she came up with this, this story. And that's why it's been so prolific is that everyone can read it and understand very viscerally why this is so relevant to every time period. It's because she wasn't aiming for, um, for, for me, for this time, f- like for the time it took me to write it. She was aiming for just good. Exactly. It's, it's an art style. Yeah. And I think the one cool thing is that you could totally put a screen over this, like a, like a skin they do on a video game mm-hmm. where everything looks the same but plays, or looks different but plays the same. Right. You could put a skin over this with the monster being an artificial intelligence. Oh, shit. Victor Frankenstein being a programmer, and all of the ways that his family dies could be like, you know, a stoplight was triggered really weirdly or something. You know, like an eagle eye type situation. That's exactly the point. It's about not taking responsibility for the independent actions of things that you create. I think that's the overall idea. I'm going to have a hard time not seeing Frankenstein in stories now. Exactly. But they, they say there's something like seven stories. There's only seven stories that have ever been written, and then they're all just different variations on that same story. And then George George R. R. Martin takes those stories, draws an arc, and then cuts it in half. <laughs> and it's a, or three quarters, or a quarter, or at the very beginning, and decides, you know what, we're going to reverse this arc. Ooh, we're building a character up dead. As soon as oh, the character gets big, dead. This character has been shit on forever and is the underdog. And look at that, dead. <laughs> <laughs> underdog story. Underdog stories never turn out well. And then there's, like, this character is obviously evil and terrible. And and, and look, th- this th- this is their motivation. Oh, no, they were a good guy. All along. Yeah, I love it. Well, the monster then says to Victor, you've made me so alone I want you to right that wrong. I want you to make another monster. Make me a companion Mm. so that I have someone to live with. And he even says, like, I will stop trying to destroy your family. I will move to the deserts of the world. I will hide from man with this companion. But if you don't, I will continue to kill everyone around you until you are as miserable as I am. Whoa. That's the promise that the monster makes him. Sorry, if he does sorry, what does he need to do? He needs to create a second monster. For him. Companion. Oh shit. Yeah. And that's his that's his demand. So there's a there's a little bit of back and forth, but basically Victor says, Okay, if this is if this is what it takes and you promise that you will leave and that will be the end of it, I will make you a companion. Wow. Yeah. So he's now stirring the pot even more. Cause- in the in the De Niro movie, isn't that like a hostage negotiation situation? Like he's just like, make me another one, do it fast. Like I don't remember it being like a like a big philosophy thing. I remember it being more like uh, like here here's my list of demands kind of situation. Okay, well I, here let me let me go a little further. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a there's a really weird inversion of the story that they chose to do in that one. So remind me of that when we get to to his wedding night. Uh, but what happens is he makes his promise and he knows he needed to learn more. Like he couldn't just make a female monster because all of his research was done to make this male monster. Oh, I think basically the idea was he needed to get more research before he made this monster. Probably also because he doesn't want to make another monster. Like he wants to make a creation and he's hoping it's not going to be as awful as the first one. He's at the drawing board and he's like, but like, I can't make the thing without the testicles. Damn it. <laughs> exactly. Something very Start similar again. to <laughs> So he ends up going on a really long trip with that same Hen- same friend, Henry. That mm. Henry friend. Mm. And they go through Britain. They go into Scotland. And Scotland is where he ultimately decides to build the companion. So he takes up refuge on some tiny little island 
which is so perfect in its pathetic fallacy because you're on this yeah. island on the coast where it's always raining and it's dark and it's miserable. It's isolated. It's like, isolated. Like monster. And like he is. Mm. So he's there. He's making the monster. It's almost completed. And he's staring at it one night. And then he starts to come up with all these ideas. He thinks, okay, well, the monster promised that it would go off to all these places, these deserts, and hide from man. But the new one never promised that. Mm-hmm. And this one says that the malice is all from his isolation. But who knows? The new one might just hate people in general. Might yeah, just want to destroy could come people. Out totally wrong. And now he's giving it a companion, which means that they could make more. Now you have an, like an army of monsters. Oh, it right? becomes reproducible. It could exactly. Potentially take over the world. So he, yeah. So he's thinking all of these other things that he wasn't originally thinking. Oh. And in in a fit of rationality and confusion, he destroys the companion that he's creating. Mm. He's building it up. He's got it on the table, and then he goes, "You know what? Enough!" And he just destroys it and just cuts it apart. Wow. Decides, you know, this is not going to happen. And the monster's been tracking him. The monster is pretty much been at his tail the whole book like he's always around and he comes in and says like what the fuck what did you do here yeah and he tells him you know do what you want i'm done i'm not making a companion i'm at your whim you know you are just gonna have to do whatever it is you threaten to do yeah and the monster tells him like this is a mistake and you're going to pay for this and then before the monster leaves he says to him I'll be with you on your wedding night. And then he Fuck. vanishes. Yeah. So Frankenstein is obviously still in kind of a state of confusion, but yeah. he knows, all right, let's just let's just go home and back to, you know, home base. I remember that from the De, De Niro one. Yes. Like, it's I, an important line in the book. I almost think that that might have been the actual line. Like, so, like, cause yep. I remember that to that effect. Me like, too. I'll be there with you on your wedding and, night. And yeah. that was one thing that they did great. I really like that they left that line in there because it is a really... Uh, impactful, creepy line because you go, oh shit, this guy has some specific intentions. And then Frankenstein just has to clean up, so he takes the monster and he sort of dumps it out in the lake, mm-hmm. which seems really sketchy. Some dude dropping body parts out in a lake, like yeah, it was I mean, 18, 19 is exactly. It just happens. Uh, but he gets caught in a storm, so he ends up actually just drifting somewhere else to the land. He doesn't make it back to his island. <laughs> and when he arrives there. Um, the people there are not friendly at all. They're actually, they all, they kind of like surround him and he's really confused what was going on until they tell him like someone was murdered here and we're pretty sure it was you because someone saw a boat just like yours pushing off from the shore when the guy was murdered. So they take him and they put him in prison and uh, it's sort of a waiting a trial, but he says like, you know, show me the body because he's now thinking like, maybe the monster did this. Mm-hmm. And they go in and they show him the body, and it's the body of his friend Henry. Oh fuck! Yeah. So now this is the second time that someone is being falsely accused for something that the monster ultimately did. Oh shit! And because Frankenstein's so delirious and just so out of it, he's talking about how it's his fault that Henry's dead, which it is. It is his fault. But everyone's kind of looking at him like. Okay, well, then he is the murderer. Yeah. Right? He's talking about it. But fortunately for him, the, the magistrate, which is kind of like a judge. It's a sweet name. Yeah, magistrate. Is magistrate. Awesome name. And so he can kind of see things a little more clearly than the people can. And they actually end up nursing Victor back to health. His father even comes to visit him to try and make him feel better, I guess, because his friend's dead now, too. Yeah. It's like, I sent you on a two-month trip to Scotland and your friend dies? Like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and... They actually go back together. So he accompanies his father, and his father takes him back to Geneva. And now he's mega paranoid. So he's carrying around knives and guns, and he's, like, ready for battle with the monster. But the key is he's worried about the monster killing him on his wedding night. That's oh. what he thinks is going to happen. So the whole time he's he's armed to the teeth, he's nervous, but he knows he just wants to get the wedding over with. So mm-hmm. that he doesn't have to, you know, I don't want to... Yeah, we're going to get married in eight months, and I'll just worry about the monster for eight months. So they get married like ten days after he gets home. And oh, they get married, and they get on a boat, and they're they're on this trip where they're just going to sail and, and do a honeymoon. So they stop one night in an inn, and they're just there. It's obviously dark and creepy. Just on on your point, you were, you were saying that there's a few things that indicate how 
uh, Crazy Rich he is. They went on a honeymoon in 1819. That's like, that's quite a statement about how much money they have. Yeah. Because <laughs> back then it would have been like, you want to get married tomorrow? Yeah, sure. And then married and then, all right, well, back to work. Back to work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the, yeah, all the while he has money. There's even scenes where he's, he's been in a place for like two, three months and he's like, oh, with the money I had left over. And you're like, what fucking money? Why do you have all this money? Like, I there just, must be I, banks filled with gold in Geneva, and he's just going in and raking it up like Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> I, you know, this is a part that I don't really want to mention, but I, I did actually make a third monster out of my money. <laughs> the money monster. I call it... The World Bank. Ooh, commentaries. Mm-hmm. It's like the Federal Reserve. Yes, that would have been a much better, better joke. <laughs> Federal Reserve is basically a money monster. <laughs> so they... They go into this little inn, and that's where they're going to stay. And so Victor thinks, okay, well, if I'm going to fight and kill this monster, I don't want her to be around to see this whole thing or potentially get hurt. So he sends her to their room while he stays to defend himself. And that's when he hears her scream. And he all of a sudden realizes, I'm not very smart. He's never hurt me before. Why would he hurt me? He wants to hurt you on the inside. And when he shows up, sure enough... She's dead, also strangled. Fuck. Yeah. So that ends up being the, just the tipping point. Now there's really no one left in his life. And when he goes back to Geneva to tell his father about it, he, his father dies <laughs> because of the stress. Oh, no. <laughs> and just, well, he's just lost two of his children. Victor Frankenstein is in all kinds of a mess. And yeah, life is just too much for him and he passes away. So, so Victor now is thinking... I have nothing to do but go and kill this monster. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. So he actually chases it virtually right out of there. So the monster ends up somewhere around Geneva, and he actually chases it on foot for a while, and then he actually gets uh, like a dog sled to follow it, and they're moving north. They're moving up to the north through all those Scandinavian countries like Finland and like the north tip of uh, Russia and stuff like that. Okay, I just want to clarify where we are in the story. So it begins... Yeah. It begins with a guy going to the to the Arctic, right? Or a wintry place. Yes. Who then hears the story from Frank and, from the monster, right? Who's telling No, Frankenstein Victor Frankenstein is oh. telling Walton this whole story. Okay, so Frankenstein tells him the story. And then it goes into a flashback to when Frankenstein was told a story by the monster about why he killed his brother. Yeah. Does it then go past the point of meeting uh, the monster, or is that still to come? Yeah, so actually, this is a good point for me to give a timeline. So everything begins um, with Walton, and that is the most future part of the story. That is the farthest into the future. Okay. When Frankenstein starts talking to Walton, he starts by talking about his childhood. So he essentially goes back, whatever, 30 years, and moves forward from there. All the way up to the point where he meets the monster. Okay. And the monster story starts two years before he meets the monster. Mm. Somewhere in the middle of Frankenstein's life. And then once the monster story is done being told, everything resumes from that point. And continues all the way up until the point that he meets Walton again. Oh. Yeah. Whoa. (laughs) So everything is leading up to the beginning of the book. That's... I could have sworn... Didn't... Didn't the monster tell the story in the in the movie? Well, he tells the story of his uh, early days, like with the cottage mm. and uh, murdering the boy and his trip to Geneva, that kind of stuff. But Frankenstein is ultimately the one telling Walton all okay. of these details. Right, okay. Like all the details of the actual story. Mm. And... Uh, and at this point, this is this is very, you know, late in the story. At this point, it's just he chases the monster. The monster keeps going north. He keeps going north. But it's harder for him, obviously. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing is that the monster is seen by Walton's ship. Okay. So that's how they get up to the north. Uh-huh. And this, this is the point at which the story does begin to move past the beginning of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, Victor Frankenstein stops telling his story. It's been like weeks and Frankenstein tells him, you either need to go northward or I wouldn't have gotten on your ship. Like Frankenstein almost died mm. before he got on the ship, but he wouldn't have gotten on if the ship was heading south. He needed to go north to find the monster. To find him, yeah. And 
at this point, Walton's ship chooses to turn around because it's too dangerous to go north, so they choose to go south. And Frankenstein tries to get out of bed, but he can't because he's so ill. Shit. And, I mean, he he still wants Walton to chase after him, but he knows it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And in that whole period, Frankenstein dies just from his oh. general injuries, his weariness, the amount of energy he's expended. And he dies on the ship. So Walton meets this friend, this wonderful friend he's been seeking forever, and then his friend dies like oh. two weeks, three weeks later, oh. after telling him this wonderful, mystical, magical story. Oh, um, wow. So the, the monster outlives the creator. Interesting. Exactly. Very interesting. Exactly. And then the monster actually comes to the ship. He visits that ship oh. where Frankenstein died, and he talks to Walton. And that's the part that the, that the monster actually narrates. He tells Walton about his side of the story, essentially. Very nice. Um, which is... It, he doesn't really indicate that Frankenstein was lying or anything like that, but he just talks about firsthand about the... Um, What's well, perspective? Exactly. The the indignation of being that isolated and alone. Yeah. And he, he looks at Frankenstein, and he knows that he didn't want Frankenstein to die. That wasn't the point. But now that it's happened, there is no point. Mm. And he mm. also realizes what Frankenstein realized, that making this monster was in no way a good thing. He says, I'm not afraid to die, but I am afraid to get to lose my life, if, they, if you understand what that means. It's, uh, it's an innate fear of death, but he doesn't have an existential fear of death. You know, he's not like, oh, what happens when I die? But he doesn't want something oh. to physically crush and kill him. So he's just, he's got like basic survival, survival instincts. Goal, yeah. yeah, exactly. And he tells Walton like, in order to not allow anyone else to learn from what Frankenstein did, I'm going to destroy myself. And he talks about oh. creating a funeral pyre and then climbing into it. That sounds very familiar. Does that, is that how the movie ends? That's how the movie ends. So in the movie, the Frankenstein is actually left on an ice float and burned with mm. the monster, which is kind of oh, cool. It's kind of okay. symbolic. Yeah, yeah, I actually yeah. liked how they did that. Um, but in actuality, Frankenstein, I think, just dies in the boat and they take him home. Hmm. Because there's no indication that... Uh, there isn't even any indication that the monster, like, does it. He just leaves the boat, and that's the end of the book. Hmm. But the thing... Again, you... though, they don't... They, they're, the book is not specific about his birth or his death. I yep. fucking love that. Because it leaves it in... It's like the... the the Inception top? I love how we both know what we're talking about. The almost falling over top. It's so much more powerful to create a conversation than it is to end... Like to make a fact and say this is how it ends. Because then it's known. There's no debate. There's yeah. no, uh, I don't want to say inquiry, but speculation. But you can't really ruin Inception either. Like, you, yeah. like of co- you go into it thinking, of course, Leo is going to be successful in his endeavor. But you couldn't be like, oh, and by the way, at the end, we're not sure if he was in a dream. Like, that's it's not, not going to give anything not, away. It's yeah. not really a spoiler. <laughs> in fact, you have to see it to really get the full you really full do. impact. It's perfectly cut. Yeah. Well, the one thing you were asking about earlier, about the how the female monster was made and how that request was made. Yeah. So this is how it goes in the movie. Frankenstein does all this stuff and tells the monster, no, I won't make you a companion. Doesn't even try to make a companion. And the monster makes that threat. I'll be with you on your wedding night. Then, in very comic fashion, he actually falls through the skylight of a boat onto Frankenstein's wife and kills her. Oh, shit. Do you not remember that? It's hilarious. He's a, it's, it's, he's leaning on a skylight. Like, he's lying flat on a skylight. And then he breaks into it and falls onto the bed on top of her and then just <laughs> murders her. It's so bizarre how they chose to do that. <laughs> I don't remember that at all, but I love it. But that's part of why she's so disfigured. Because she gets all cut up, and uh, I think he even, like, rips out her heart or something crazy. Yeah, something silly. So Frankenstein is so distraught that he decides to use his technology to bring her back to life. Mm. So he brings Elizabeth back to life, in not the, some other... In the movie. Yeah, in the movie. Right, right. Not some other companion. He actually brings his sister wife back to life, and then is horrified again <laughs> because it's a monster. And then the monster comes in and goes, oh, wow, this is... Perfect. Like, this is what I wanted. Thank you. Yeah. And she is so aggrieved by her yeah. state 
that she breaks a lantern over her head and burns herself alive oh, and then I jumps remember, out a window. I remember that. Just in case. <laughs> yes, exactly. Case do exactly. Enough. So I, I think that that was a very, uh, it was a bizarre corruption because it wasn't necessary, but it got all the same plot points across. And it sort of, it's kind of, it kind of, um, it seems more modern. It seems so much more played out. Like, Oh, and then his wife died, so we had to bring her back to life, but it wasn't good enough, so she killed herself. It's like, yeah, I think it was supposed to be a statement about how if anyone had the choice, that they wouldn't take that, they, they wouldn't that take life. the revival choice, yeah. Well, as Frankenstein didn't have an option. Did, did she remember who she was? Did Hel- Helen Bonacarmer? She recognized his face. Hmm. So it, it was all very strange because I feel like the way they did it in the book was awesome. The yeah. idea that he tried to make this companion, but he just he couldn't bring himself to make that same mistake again. Yeah. And in doing that, he sort of set himself up for what was to come. But using her as this kind of pawn to be the companion monster, I felt like that was kind of a weird cop out. Uh-huh. because he didn't use any sort of corpse to make the original monster. He made it. He created oh, it. it. He just, didn't... Yeah, a small piece of it. It wasn't just a patchwork of... Well, its arms wouldn't be the right size. It's Everything would be disproportionate if you tried to use human pieces to make a nine-foot monster. Right. So, I don't know, eight or nine feet? Anyways. It's... It makes more sense to me that the making of the companion was similar to the making of the monster. Right. Where it was done from the ground up, and then... You know, he'd animate it with life after the fact. So I think that movie was a really good approximation of the book. Right. But that is about the best I can give it. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of the best ones if you want to get a really quick sense of Frankenstein. Yeah. Because it does follow the the Walton plot point. It has them, you know, on out in the ice. It has a lot of the the more concrete ideas, but it doesn't have the philosophy. Yeah. That's what it's missing. Well, philosophy is so important to a, to a story that's supposed to be about philosophy. And I think that the philosophy is always hidden. Like, one thing I thought was really interesting mm. is that the whole book, Frankenstein, is sick. The whole goddamn book, he's sick. So let me let me just lay out some of this. Oh. He goes to Ingolstadt to do university, and when he creates the monster, he falls into a crazy sickness because he works so hard to make the monster. Yeah. Then once the sickness is over, he goes home, and then when he's at home, he's um, he does like this the whole murder thing, and he goes and he meets the monster, and the monster threatens him, and then he sets out to do the companion. Yeah. And on that trip, he gets deathly sick again. Then, once he's revived from that, makes the companion, sees Henry dead, falls deathly sick again. (laughs) Then, when he's revived from that, he goes back to Geneva, the wife dies, and then he follows the monster up to the north, where he becomes deathly sick again and dies. (laughs) Holy shit. So, there's, I, I wish I had added it up, but they probably spend almost a year and a half nursing him. Wow. To health. Different people, different wow. places. But yeah, he's always in need of being nursed back to health. He's always dying. Man, that's probably supposed to, like, not mirror, but somehow, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to put these things together. But he's put life into something that shouldn't have life, while it's his life, he's supposed to have life in it's keeps being sapped there's a really interesting part that i I was even talked about in like the the afterwards kind of afterthoughts yeah as the monster gains power victor seems to lose power it's the idea that the monster is almost siphoning off victor's energy and power in order to become what it is and yeah the, the sickness is i guess one of the ways that she chooses to show that that's brilliant the whole I mean, thing is like, brilliant I think the, pro- the probably why every time the story keeps getting all muddled up and he turns into like a big green goof who like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, like I think that <laughs> probably comes from like that's more of a statement about the people at the time because you could write a story. I mean, you still can write a story like that, but 1819 was a little bit of a different time period. People were actually down to sit down and read a whole fucking book. But now people are not nearly like the reason why I was so excited for J.J. Abrams to do Star Wars is because that's what he should have been doing from the start. Star Trek was like a resume for that, but he shouldn't have made 
Star Trek into an action uh, movie. Both of them were because it's not an act. It's 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 a it's a show about philosophy. So I think that, that the the reason why Frankenstein's always done this way, uh, the, the the dumb way, the non philosophy way, is this more of a, a a statement or a commentary on the audience of the time. And their ability to look into those things and think about those things yeah. critically. I, I almost think that if you were to try to accomplish Frankenstein the way that it was done in the book, you would find the, today's like um, Reddit, like always on their phones generation to look at it and be like, almost the way that you would if he were real. Like you look at him as a monster and not this intelligent creature that almost might like they might actually be worried that the audience looks at him the way that people would in the story like that might almost yeah. even be the way that they have depicted him since then like the 80s up till now almost might actually be its statement on its own and it's true the the whole idea that he's even referred the monster is referred to as frankenstein and things like that yeah sort of subscribe to this idea that the monster is being like infantilized in a lot of ways and i think it's strange because the monster yeah. is probably smarter than frankenstein in some ways it's yeah the monster is a super creature other than his appearance he's stronger faster smarter and just generally more capable than any human that's ever existed yeah and his only problem is that he can't be accepted into human society because of how he looks. deformed he is yeah and also an eight foot tall person is pretty weird for us mm -hmm. like most eight feet tall people you see they're fairly decrepit because it's impossible to keep an eight foot frame in good condition right it's just so much body mass oh yeah and you're so high off the ground but this creature was designed like that so imagine a big Eight foot tall, thick, thick dude yeah. who can climb mountains. He's probably 350, 400 pounds. He's basically like a super mutant. Yeah, right? he's a berserker. Yeah. He's just this crazy, huge, he's an NFL linebacker in 20 years. Yeah. That's what he is. He's just this absolute monster truck. And I think even if he did look like a normal person, people would be very freaked out, especially in the 1800s when people were like four foot eight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People would have been a lot smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I really like the book, and I think that all of the movies do some small justice to the book, mm -hmm. but none of them have really captured the the important parts. The important parts are the ones where he doesn't describe how the monster comes to life. That, to me, is one of the most important It is. Di it's, so, it's so important because that is actually one of the main premises of the book. The idea is that the monster will not be done again. Whether Frankenstein has to hide this knowledge and destroy the monster and burn everything to the ground so that no one discovers it, or whether it's the monster killing himself so that no one discovers it. Yeah. Neither the creator nor the monster want another monster. Wow. That's, to me, probably the most important distinction across the whole thing is that neither his birth or his death are specifically shown or, or discussed in the book, and they are in everything else. And that's, that's a huge difference, especially when you're talking about something that's about philosophy. You're taking something fuzzy and you're making it concrete. Very obvious and, and clear. And that's a problem. It's like if there was an extended edition of Inception where he's like, oh, yeah, it fell over. And you're like, what? <laughs> you extended the movie by three seconds just to ruin the final scene? <laughs> yeah, like, okay, I, I mean, fine, I guess it's your movie, but... But why? Yeah, that's... Well, it's amazing how many people have a, a completely wrong idea of Frankenstein's monster. And hopefully this will clear a lot of things up. Because when I was a kid, I thought he was a big green goof with bolts in his neck who was born by It's Alive! That even turned into like a like a robot chicken reference. Yeah. Like, and it's so different. And I'm sure there are so many, like people probably growing up thinking that that's what that Star Trek is all about setting your phasers to kill even though the actually it's probably a big difference is that almost every star trek television series was set your phasers to stun yeah while as everything in the movies is set your phasers to kill it's a big difference the same it's a way total change the same way setting lighting him up with lightning as opposed to not showing it is a massive difference wow i am 
I'm really glad that you had the um, attention span to both read an entire book in 2016 <laughs> and and also to be able like because you really you really were really good at describing this to me because like, and I'm and thanks dude. I'm really not into books but I love stories so it was really good to to hear about it because the whole time you kept telling me like oh I'm reading this book let's do a podcast and I thought oh, that was a pretty good idea and that was it. Like, it didn't go that far. I didn't think, like, well, this actually could be a fucking fantastic idea. And this actually could be very in- instructional or um, educational for people. And I would say that this shouldn't preclude you from reading the book. Because as I said, it's a short book. So if I remember I read it and I knew what happened because I read it in grade 10. Mm-hmm. So I knew all of the basic things that I've outlined here. And reading it was still cool because, well, some words you didn't understand and you're just not going to. Like, um indefatigable mm. which i'm pretty sure means you can't be fatigued i don't know <laughs> there's some crazy colorful language but overall actually getting to read it was cool because she did a good job with those scenes where you would actually just sit up yeah it would be you know lots of description lots of um you know not so much happening but she's talking about how they do it going from and to things and then all of a sudden boom she's talking about a murder yep and that's awesome yeah it was a it was a book that you know I was kind of hanging on the words and it was short enough that I didn't feel hopeless. When you're a hundred pages in and you're halfway through, it feels like you can manage it. Yeah. So wow. I hope everyone gets a a little more appreciation for Frankenstein and go watch the 1994 Mary Shelley Frankenstein and then leave a comment about your favorite inaccuracy. Yes. Whatever yes, it is. Let's make it. A, let's make it a fun game. Yeah, that too. And. You know, just let us know what you think about this. If if this if you've never heard of the Frankenstein story, or if you have some things that we got wrong, I'm sure we're not 100. percent I mean, you have notes, which is impressive because the sh- nothing on the show ever has notes. But uh, I'm sure there's something here and there that someone would would might have noticed that uh, that you never made the connection with, or yeah. And I read this book once, and I didn't take notes as I went through. It was mostly. You know, oh yeah, that was a cool thing. Like I want to write that down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's definitely some some things that are not going to be so perfect, but I hope that this brings some appreciation for what Mary Shelley did in the first place. Yeah, and sure will. why she wanted to. Because I didn't give a shit about Frankenstein until you told me about it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could see this turning into a series of its own. Like I would uh, love it. Uh, you read a book and explain it to a dummy. Well, it's like you said, stories. Stories are Story, awesome. Yeah, stories are fun. Reading them from printed little tiny pages all crammed together, maybe not as awesome, mm-hmm. but goddamn is the story good. Yeah, and turning it to uh, an idea of a, philosoph- a philosophical idea that can be applied to many things is also really... Um, I'm probably... Get, I, I'm going to have a hard... Yeah, I'm going to have a hard time looking at something and, being, and, and saying like, well, I'm, I guess it's an iteration of frankenstein or something like that but yeah no it's not the true iteration exactly maybe we should look at we should find out whether that the original is actually in english but yeah all right well ladies and gentlemen thank you for joining us on the frankenstein podcast i suppose mary shelley's frankenstein podcast yes that's wonderful goodbye